Okay, I think it's time for us to get started here. Um, thank you everyone for coming to the final evenings at Whitney for uh, 2015. Um, but uh, never fear, uh, the seminar series begins again um, next month in January, where a veterinary named Judith McCarsky is going to be coming here. And the title of her talk is Mad About Poo. And I, I, it's actually a very interesting uh, subject about how uh, diseases that are carried in our domestic pets uh, affect uh, natural marine mammal populations. Uh, please check our website and for the dates and things like that so you can come out and uh, make sure you don't miss that. Tonight, uh, we are going to hear from one of Whitney's own faculty, Todd Osborne. Todd Z. Osborne, I believe. I always like the, mid the crazy middle initials. Um, like many of you know Todd because he's an avid outdoorsman. He is a paddler, surfer, fisher, liar. No, no, that's, no, that's what all fishermen are like. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean that. But um, he's actually um, uh, been living in this area for some time, and uh, he is deeply concerned with the environment here, uh, water quality, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think you'll, you'll really uh, learn to understand what, where he's coming from um, after his uh, seminar is over. Now, Todd got his bachelor's at uh, Georgia Tech, did a master's in environmental engineering in Gainesville, took his PhD in soil science at Gainesville, so he's a gator. And um, Todd is a biogeochemist. And um, that is a big word because it actually represents a large amount of uh, information about how the world works. If you just think of it, you just break it down, biology, geology, and chemistry. And how all those different areas interact with one another is an important component about how the world works, where the world came from, and where the world is going. And so, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Todd Osborne, and the title of his talk is Evolution of Coastal Systems in Florida, A Story of Climate and Time. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I thank you. I appreciate that. You know, the, the truth around, yeah, yeah, it sure had. I was worried. Um, the truth about being a biogeochemist is, is it means that you're either unable to say no to projects or you have adult ADD, and I'm not sure which it is for me. But um, no, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you all for coming out tonight. You know, as a new faculty here, I was hired two years ago uh, next week. This is one of the things you get to do, and it, it's, a, it's a rite of passage, but also a great pleasure to come talk about what you do to the local community. So, so thank you for your support. I want to talk to you about evolution of coastal ecosystems. And to do that, we're going to get out of biogeochemistry and kind of dip back into, into uh, geology. So, so what I want to do tonight is give you a sense of place. Let's talk about the things that you guys see every day when you're driving up and down the road, the ecosystems that you're familiar with here in Florida, and put them into a, a context um, of geology and how things happen over long time periods. I'm going to give you a, a little primer on the geologic history of Florida, and then right at the end we're going to talk about the actual evolution of these coastal ecosystems and, and what they're doing. You know, coming from the seafloor up to the hammock and back again, um, my goal was to give you an idea of things that are in transition and the ability to cue into those as they appear uh, when you're out interacting with the environment in Florida. So let's start with ecosystems in Florida. We're all familiar with the state. Who's been here for, for over 20 years? Wow, all right. How about 30 years? Okay, so you have seen in that time period, 30 years to me is a long time. That's like 75% of my life. But, I had to throw that in there. But, but in 30 years to geologic times, nothing, right? So ecosystems take time to develop, and that's one thing that we're going we're gonna to discuss a little bit. But in that 30 years, you've probably seen some dramatic changes in the state. We're familiar with a lot of the upland ecosystems in Florida. So this is the, the pine savanna. This is a maritime hammock. But we also see pine flatwoods that have um, the same types of vegetation. Anybody familiar with the uh, uh, kind of dry, scrubby oak areas in the Ocala National Forest? They're, they're very dry, and they're also characterized by having a lot of, of open ground. And we also have a lot of aquatic ecosystems in Florida. We're one of the wet states, right? Now, it's a pretty dramatic change to go from, from this area, super dry, and only, only supports scrubby, scrubby vegetation, over to our, our wet systems. But we have 
quite a few lakes and ponds in Florida, lots of swamps. This is a cypress swamp uh, from uh, Ocala. And then, of course, the Everglades, my favorite, down here is all open water marsh. Similarly, on the coastline, we have a, we have a, a very diverse ecosystem set, too. So our salt marshes that we're all, we all see every time we drive up and down uh, A1A or cross the, the 206 bridge or the, the 312 bridge, and high-energy shorelines. So this picture is right across the street here. You guys might recognize the Coquina Rock, which is kind of rare in the state of Florida to be on the beach. Low-energy shorelines, so this is more, more evident of um, the shorelines on the west coast of Florida. Estuarine systems, where rivers meet the sea. Seagrass beds and seagrass systems, farther south from here. And then, of course, mangrove ecosystems. So the, the latter part of the state, the lower part of the state, is almost dominated by those systems. And what I want to tell you is that all of these ecosystems all have several things in common. And they're not necessarily uh, right out there in the open. You know, we see vegetation, we see animals, and we see water. Um, but they are all very much uh, related to each other in terms of elevation relative to the water level, uh, the soil characteristics underneath them, and then there's an influence of, of bedrock in the state of Florida on ecosystems and how they exist. And that's a very rare thing. It's, it's a, uh, across the world, this influence of limestone bedrock, or what we call karst topography here in Florida, um, is kind of rare. So if we look at this map of Florida, we'll see there's, there's, there's well-drained soils, um, deep sands, right? And these are all marine deposits. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And there's some, some poorly drained sands with organic hard pans. This is actually a picture of our Florida state soil. Did you know we had a Florida state soil? Neither did I until just recently. But so what, what, um, what that is is a, a very well-drained surface soil, and then there's an accumulation of stuff down at the bottom. And that's actually where the, the high water table is during part of the year in a lot of our ecosystems. So elevation relative to water table and soil characteristics play a big role. We also have, in very few places in the state of Florida, we have clay. And these are, these are rarities. These are also marine deposits. But they come into play, too, because they keep water from moving. So there's a very, there's a very uh, common theme throughout all of these systems. And as they, as they grow and evolve, their, their vegetation and the animals that use those sites are, are closely related to how water level affects those, those types. Those vegetation types, they help create the soils. The soils then reinforce the vegetation. It's a, kind of a close-knit system. You'll notice, I mentioned bedrock, and in Florida, you guys recognize this, um, this circular pattern. This is in Kissimmee. All these lakes are in Kissimmee. And they're all a function of very shallow soils and very, very close to what we call lithic contact or contact with bedrock. So this limestone, as you know, sinkholes form everywhere. And these lakes are all evidence of that, that process going on. All right, why we build next to them, I don't know. But this is something you don't want to see, right, uh, when you're looking for your, for your next property. I, in fact, I, I've, this is so common in Florida, it's unnerving. But that karst topography is, is a, a major player, and it's an it's a ongoing process. So it's not, it happened back here, it's happening every day. And so as we, as we move through time, these kind of events occur readily. And they shape the, they shape the landscape. So here's an example of, of two types of limestone, and I'm going I'm to say that limestone builds the basis of our state, and we're going to start there, talking about geology. But if you're, if you're driving around uh, and you're in you know, the Suwannee River or Suwannee Springs, you'll see limestone like this, this sharp, jagged uh, calcium carbonate stone on the left, or in other places, not far away in Levy County, you might see limestone that looks kind of like this, well-degraded, like, almost like chalk. Same, same parent material, same stuff, but as it, as it weathers on the landscape, we have all kinds of neat stuff that happens. So you have collapsing sinkholes and caves and all this underground structure, spring systems, disappearing streams. All these things are common in Florida. And then if you look across the landscape and see all these depressions, that's where they come from. Those are, those are interactions with that, that limestone base that create these low spots. Oftentimes across the landscape, those low spots fill in with water, when the water table's high, and you end up with wetlands. And you know how important wetlands are in our state. They're, they're very common. So, to kind of set the stage of, of geology, I'm gonna, we're going to take it all the way back to the formation of Florida. And this is one of my favorite parts. Um, Florida is, is based on, on limestone, and limestone is simply 
uh, a geologic feature of lots of old calcium carbonate materials pressed together, right? So who, who's seen the coquina across the street on the beach? All right, so that is a form of limestone. It's just really new, right? It's just really new. So um, old limestone like these that, that, that build the platform that our, that our current Florida sits on were put down a long time ago, 200 million years, right? Up until about 5 million years ago. So limestone building was, was, really, was really common, and it's all old coral reef material. These are all, the base of that material is all old, ancient fossilized pieces and parts of, of um, marine organisms. On top of that is some neat stuff called oolite. That's what the geologists call it. It's basically sand grain sized materials from coral reefs. And then, of course, some of the more recent limestone is, is actually recognizable pieces of coral. And if you're, if you're ever in South Florida and you, and you see what they put on the road base, all the crushed white limestone, it's quarried down there, and you can go and look in the quarries and see all these kind of things readily. So the, the, the ancient materials are there. Now, to, to kind of illustrate uh, how this process worked, I want to I walk you through um, the rise of Florida out of the ocean. And this is, this is, um, these are done by some colleagues, Edward Petuk and Charles Roberts. And these are guys down at FAU. They're both geologists, and they've spent their careers figuring out how Florida works. And so we're going to go through a time series from 37 million years ago up to about 125,000 years ago through this series of slides. And what I want to point out to you is so you can see this is a, this is a reef system, a coral reef system, right, building. But if you, if you look closely, you'll notice that the outline of Florida is there. It's just underwater. It's quite a bit underwater. And over time, Florida starts to rise out of that ocean. Now, it's not building up as much as sea level is dropping. And we're going to talk about climate change. We're going to talk about how um, sea level rise and sea level fall are really generating the processes that, that form our state and form our ecosystems. But so what do you see here? Is it, it, looks, it looks like we're starting to break the surface. Maybe even that's vegetation. The southern rim of Florida, the Florida Keys are starting to show up. At 28 million years ago, 24 million years ago, it looks a little bit different, but we start to see reef systems off, offshore and then lots of, lots of low relief escarpments on the west coast. As we go through time, the length of the peninsula of Florida grows, all right? And as that happens, all of this reef material is, is moving, moving this way. It's growing to the south. Now, what you don't see in an anim animation of this is that at the same time, Sea level goes out and comes back, and goes out and comes back. And so I can't tell you how many times that occurs over the millennia that we're looking at, but if this is, this is a terrestrial ecosystem, it comes and goes. You know, the sea level may rise up again and cover that. It may drop down again and expand Florida 100 miles east and maybe 200 miles west, and that goes back and forth. And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But so the state of Florida is growing as we move forward in time. This is 12 million years ago. We're starting to see more, more islands form and then this open, kind of like a, like a, a quasi-open bay down in South Florida. It's going to end up to be the Everglades and the areas of um, Miami, etc. So seven million years ago, it's still going on. Things are changing pretty rapidly. We're starting to see the Cape Canaveral pop up right about then. And then all of these, sorry, all of these outer, outer atoll-sized you know, islands, the coral reef, uh, outer reefs building up with this open sea in the middle. As we get close to, close to present day, and this is in geologic time, of course, um, we start to see the real development of Florida. So Lake Okeechobee is going to end up right there. And this is called the Okeechobee Strait. And that was a waterway that cut across the state. And we, we know that because we can see the, the escarpments in limestone. All right, and so this is getting pretty close. 125,000 years ago. Seems like a super long time, but in geologic time, that's pretty recent. And then present day. Okay, so as... As we go, I want to point out, you know, all these areas on the, on the southeast coast of Florida are, are where Miami, Palm, uh, West Palm Beach, all those, all those areas are now. In the last hundred years, they were called the Rocky Glades, this whole area. But it's all former coral reef, literally right at the ground surface. So there's not any soil there. They're scraping almost bare limestone uh, to build those cities. And it's a, very, it's, a, it's a great building foundation for a while. But as you know... Things are going on. We'll talk about sea level rise a little bit, you know. Um, there's a time limit on all of this. Okay, so, so that's, that's modern-day Florida. 
And you might be wondering, and, and I, you know, and when I first started picking these things up, uh, uh, I said, well, how do we know that? How do you really know it's 200 million years ago? So all these processes are actually captured in this great fossil record in limestone. And it's not just fossil organisms, but also events. So this is an open limestone in the Suwannee River. If you're paddling down the river, uh, you can actually see these escarpments, and you can see fossil organisms, corals, all kinds of neat things. And you might notice this red band. We call this a discontinuity in geologic terms, but this discontinuity is full of iron and all kinds of stuff. And it gives it a little bit of a reddish tint. And so that correlates very well with the loss of the dinosaurs. And so that, that meteor strike actually, well, what we believe happened, uh, created quite a bit of um, aerosolized sulfur in the atmosphere. We had a lot of acid rain, and we had a lot of displaced iron. And all that stuff ended up out here accumulating in that limestone. All right, so we can put, put time stamps on some of this. All right. Sharks in Gainesville? Really? Well, at, at one point in geologic history, not so long ago, three to five million years ago. I know in my series of slides you didn't see the ocean come back over Gainesville, but it did several times over those series of slides. The animation for this is like four CDs long and I didn't want to play it, but it, over that time period there's lots of sea level rise and fall. And so there were giant sharks swimming in, in, uh, in the Gainesville area and we know that because we find their teeth. These things are gigantic. It's like six, six inches long. So this is your normal, I say normal, gigantic uh, carcaridon, carcarius, great white shark, the thing I don't want to see when I'm out surfing. Um, and then we look back in time, we see these giant sharks, and uh, it gives a whole new meaning to we need a bigger boat, right? So these guys are, these guys are huge, and they were swimming around in a shallow sea uh, outside of Gainesville, Florida, three to five million years ago. So these things are out there, and we're able to find them and find evidence of them, and that gives us an uh, ability to, to timestamp geologic formations all around. Another one that you guys are probably familiar with, mammoths in Orlando. So these are mammoth teeth. These are prized finds in the Suwannee River, the Santa Fe River. People are diving near shore on the West Coast find these all the time, you know, and they're, they're gigantic. That's a, that's a big tooth, um, and that's a big animal. But so... Ice Age Florida was only 20,000 years ago. You know, that's not that long ago. You know, we think about climate change and, wow, it's half a degree warmer this year than it was 10 years ago. But, but climate change was dramatic in our history. It's been extremely dramatic. And so the point I want to make about that is 20,000 years ago, we had an ice age. Weird things were happening to Florida. The outline of the state was actually way out here. Florida was, was 400 feet higher in elevation than it is today. So sea level was way down here. You know, the, the Bahamas were giant mountaintops, right? And so over that, that last 20,000 years, quite a few things have happened. All right, the sea level has come up. We know we find the, the fossil remains of, of um, land animals way out here in the ocean. Uh, we also find them offshore here. And we also know that in, even in the, in the Pliocene, the five million year ago time frame, that, that we had we had a shoreline here. So dramatic change, 20,000 years, a 500-foot change in elevation. That's, that's, that's dramatic. And we're talking about millimeters sometimes when we talk about sea level rise you see in the newspaper. So anyway, I want you to keep that in mind because that is, that is significant in how the state of Florida has formed and, and how the ecosystems have formed that we see today. Okay, so let's kind of walk through the process. And I said that, that the landscape in Florida is kind of a story. It's a, it's a bunch of processes. These are physical processes. Um, as a biogeochemist, you know, I'm very interested in all the, the ways biology works into geology and geochemistry and all those little things. But in, in reality, the forming of our state as it is today was really mostly a physical process, the physical process of, of erosion, so weathering, erosion of materials, and deposition of those materials somewhere else. Okay, and, and I'm going to restate that ecosystem formation and persistence is definitely a function of elevation relative to water level. So let's pretend that this is kind of what Florida looked like uh, at this process. The Appalachian Mountains rise up, right, in this area, and they're granitic, meaning they're made out of granite, and they are eroding over this whole time period, you know, 
climate change, temperature changes, all kinds of things happen. Ice ages come down and go back, right? And they're breaking those mountains down. And as they do, all of that erosional material forms the Piedmont, right? So this whole area of Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and then the coastal plain. All of that is erosion materials from the Appalachian Mountains. So we can trace it back through the minerals that are in there and know where its source was. And in fact, I'm going to tell you about how all that stuff ends up down here and makes Florida. But only, only the choice pieces, right? We get, we get the last little nuggets, the siliciclastic sediments. And that's the big word for tonight. Um, everybody says, don't use those words. But quartz, you know, this means it's quartz sand. It means it comes from granite. And it's small particles, and they're made out of the materials that build up granite rocks. So we know what they are. You know, it's the same stuff you see on the beach. In fact, the same stuff you see all across the state. Okay, and that's how it got there. Ends up in the coast, coast brings it down, and it, it deposits on Florida on top of that limestone platform, right? And you say, that's a lot of sand. Absolutely. There's no, no problem moving large amounts of sand. Dunes in other places in the world can be three or 400 feet high. So bringing in all this sand is not that big of a deal. It just takes a long time. So let's think about that in terms of how long does it really take. Now, this map is, is interesting. And what I want to point out about this map is that when we walk across the state, we're over here. If we were to drive all the way over to Cedar Key, Florida, we would go through basically 56 million years of processes. We could see all those on the side of the road. And in fact, you can. I hope, hope the next time you go there, you'll look for these, these things that we talk about tonight. But in fact, these materials, these yellow materials, were, were laid down in the Pleistocene era. That's about 2.6 million years ago, up to roughly 20,000 years ago. These, these materials have been eroded, exposing things that were laid down earlier. All right? And those have been eroded in other places, farther down, all the way down to this Eocene material. This is, this is actually limestone bedrock. Who's familiar with the um, Shands Hospital in Gainesville? The Big Hill? You guys know the Big Hill right beside the hospital? It's really steep. Okay, so that's the Cody Scarp, and that's the transition from one of these geologic features to the next. And that's where you go from marine deposits of clay and sand down to bedrock. So if you were to go over off the parking lot in Gainesville and scrape a little hole, the soil's about this deep, and there's limestone down there. And then you, it's basically flat from there on over to the, the Gulf Coast. It doesn't seem that way when you're looking at it, but that hill is that, that break point right there. And that's how, that's how we see the, the landscape. You know, it has a lot of stuff piled up on it. Um, we're going to come back to this map in a few minutes. But the point I want to make, the one I want you to take home, is that over time, not only have these things been deposited on the top of this limestone platform, right? But then they've been moved around. So, you know, we're seeing old stuff, and this new stuff's been scraped off and eroded away and ended up either out here in the ocean or maybe out here off the beach. So, the types and depths of sediments really come into play when we start thinking about how the, the surface reacts. You know, how do... How do um, estuaries or tidal marshes form, and why do they form and where they do? What about uh, the pine flatwoods or the cypress domes? They are all forming really very close to features on the landscape dictated by all that material that's been moved on and off of that limestone platform, right? And in some cases, places that interact with it. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but I want to give you an idea of how important those old processes, those geologic processes were to, to defining the elevations, the, uh, um, the material base, the water, how water moves through these systems, where they sit on the landscape. All are the, those, are the, those are the pieces of the puzzle. Now, this is the fun part. I, um, I, I want to spend some time talking about the, the, the coastal ecosystem evolution as it were, because that's the, that's the part that we see the most here. It's this part that, that we experience, even in that short time frame of 10, 20, 30 years, you get to see these processes. And I'm going to argue that you might even see these processes on a daily basis. And if you're paying attention, hopefully after this talk, you'll start to pick up on these, these little cues out there. So I'm going to talk about coastal geomorphology. And basically what that means is the processes and the, the signals from the environment that give us an idea of how how things are oriented in the environment. So 
We've got that limestone platform. We've got all this neat marine deposits, these sands and clays that have come down from the, the points north, the Appalachian Mountains and all those states. And they've ended up on, the, on this platform. And now things are happening and directing those, those, those sediments to be forming ecosystems or to be bases for ecosystems. In particular, seascapes, this is, this is a familiar, this is the inlet uh, uh, just north of Jacksonville near um, Little Talbot. You'll notice there's a barrier island here um, and then there's all kinds of sediment moving around. Have you guys noticed the, the sand moving into the Matanzas Inlet? Yeah, I'm sure it's a little disconcerting to you. It is to me. That's one of my favorite, favorite places to be. And um, so this process is ongoing. It's actually a, this movement of sand is not uncommon, but in, in terms of, of our time frame of reference, you know, these things tend to happen um, slowly. And then one day you look and, wow, the inlet's almost filled up. What's going on? Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I'm also going to talk about... Um, the sand processes themselves, and I want to I get into that next. I want to point out, though, that we can't forget about these limestone landforms and how they play into how ecosystems form. Now, we saw the sinkhole lakes. We saw the, the uh, dramatic picture of, of houses sinking into the ground. But if you look at this, and I, I don't know how that's coming out for you guys in the back, but this is the west coast of Florida. So this is um, uh, just north of, of Tampa. And you'll see all these little round holes in the marsh. And those are all relic sinkholes. Okay? So there's very little sand here, just a light, light skin over top, of, over top of limestone. I'm going to orient you. This is the Gulf of Mexico. This is the, the open, headed to the word open water. Salt marsh systems, mangrove trees popping up, and then exposed sand and limestone ponds. And so you can see, even, even at that scale of just a thin fringe on the beach there or on the coastline. These are, these are creating ecosystems that will potentially persist for a while. You know, if sea level rises, this ground isn't going to build, it's going to become deep habitat, right? So we're going to look at that a little bit more as well. So as a, who lives on the beach? Does anybody live on the beach? Lucky. I wish I was there too. Um, so what, what happens every single day at your beach Waves are coming in. Even, even in the middle of the summer when it's almost as flat as flat can be, waves are coming in and sand is moving. And now what I want to show you here is how that sand moves. And this process here is really what's built most of Florida over, over long periods of time. So in the summertime, you know, our long shore current comes from the south, moves to the north, and it kind of slowly moves sand northward. And in the winter, we have our nor'easters, makes great, great waves, uh, big surf, and the, the dominant current switches and goes from north to south. And that's all a, fu a function of wind direction and wave energy and all those things. But as, it, as that occurs, we've got sand moving down the beach in one direction or another. And not only is it moving down the beach, but it's also building up and washing away. So there's, there's two directions there. There's up, you know, latitude-wise, up and down, and then longitude-wise, in and out of the coastal zone. All right? And the point I want to make about this is that the beach building process is one that we can see all the way across the state of Florida. And it really is the, is the driving mechanism behind the landforms that we're going we're to see in present day. So waves come in. This is, this is a, common, a common process. And sand moves in these zones. And you'll see on this diagram, they kind of indicate the, the time frames that these things happen. Over weeks, offshore bars kind of come and go. Shoals come and go over, over weeks. Day processes in the surf zone. Hour processes up on the beach. You ever notice you, you go out at, at high tide and you see all this stuff that's pushed up on the top and then tide goes out and it moves down and, and you wonder, you know, well, how, how fast that process goes. It moves things around. Well, once that sand gets up in here and the tide drops, well, then the wind takes over and it moves sand. You've seen, you've seen the dune systems here. Some of, our parks, some of our parks here have, you know, those dunes intact, those primary dunes. But wind moves those. If you leave something on the beach in the afternoon in the summertime, you see all that fine sand kind of rafts up against it. So that process is going on all the time, all right? So waves are building the beach. Wind is building these, these um, wave-looking structures, these dunes. 
And this goes on a majority of the time. Now, this, is, this process is punctuated by kind of dramatic, episodic events. And this is the, the beach, the beach uh, disaster. If you're, if you're um, on the coastline uh, and you're losing inches or feet of beach in these erosional events, you know, it appears like you know, this process is, is going gonna, is gonna to overwash us. Well, it's, it's part of that, and I'm going to call it like a two steps forward, one step back. You, you get long-term accretion of sand, and you get these short episodic removals. And what happens is, you know, the waves come in, they grab the sand, they pull it off, and you end up with some shoaling beach deposits out here. And over time, those, those come back. That slow, uh, slow profile building that we see up on the top left corner um, replaces those eroded spots. If you're familiar with, with the south side of Matanzas Inlet, you see the, the beach profile change dramatically during storms, and then slowly it builds up. Over the summer, we get our sandbars back, and the first couple of swells in the winter, they, it, it takes it away again. And this process moves up the coast and moves back down the coast. And what I want to show you about this is um, what we see is not abnormal when it comes to filling inlets and, and things like that. And we're going we're gonna to see that in, in, in pictures in a minute. But let's take a look at this. This is my, um, my, my uh, poor artist rendition, and it, and it does get worse, I apologize, uh, for, for Anastasia Island. And so on the Atlantic side here, in the intercoastal waterway, what we know is the embayment on the inside of the island. And if we think about this as a profile, if we could just cut through the ground and look at it. We have these offshore bars, we have our, we have our beach, and then we have our dune system. And in between that dune system and the back island dunes is, you know, this, this large flat area. And if we were to look at that in terms of ecosystems on, on the island, we've got our uh, energetic beach, our maritime hammock in the middle, right, and then our salt marshes and stuff in the back. And I want you to think about this, and, and I'm going to put this idea uh, out there for you to consider while we're looking at the next couple of slides. But if this were the state of Florida... I might be able to sell you on the idea that, that that is the same kind of profile that our state has. You know, the same, the same kind of profile from east coast to west coast that we have on our barrier island. And so I want to unpackage that a little bit and, and talk about that a little bit and see if I can convince you. But let's think about that um, because the process that builds all of those systems is exactly the same. Let's, um, let's look at this dune. So what do we see? You know, big giant sand dunes. In the background, you, you notice those are, those are monsters, right? So those are big dune systems, and they, they kind of have that repetitive wave look to them, don't they? But then up close, they do the same thing. So if you look here, these little tiny dunes are on the surface of this great big dune, you know, and that, that pattern repeats itself. And I want to I wanna cue you into that pattern and see if we can see that in other places. So, again, our... our um, our barrier island is, is very dynamic, it's moving very fast, and it has this, this series of dunes. And in here it's kind of flat, I wonder what happened there. But let's, let's, let's think about that in terms of sand dunes, and what happens to sand dunes over time, right? They erode, wouldn't you say? So the, the, the steep dunes are breaking down, wind and rain events are going on, and they're, they're kind of flattening, their, their peaks and troughs are filling in, their peaks are breaking down, and we end up with kind of a, a low relief very subtle landscape. And I'm going to argue with you that that's exactly what we see when we drive across the state of Florida. There's a couple of spots in there with some, with some uh, bigger dunes. Who, who's familiar with Putnam Hall? On your way to Gainesville. You guys that drive to Gainesville. Okay, you know, and you go across Roller Coaster Road, right? So those are all ancient sand dunes. But in between, here and there, it's pretty flat. It seems pretty flat until you get to the... Um, uh, St. John's River from here. But those, these patterns, there's the big, big dunes in the middle of the state. There's the flat spots. I want you to start thinking about the state of Florida as a barrier island. Now, we have, we have these things repeating on several scales. Remember that. Um, we're going to look at dunes and profiles that are this big and then all these little things that are going on here on the surface. Are the same, same building blocks, same processes that create small wetlands 
in your neighbor's, your neighbor's property um, that create the giant hills in the center of the state. So if you're driving to uh, Orlando and you go through the highest elevation of Florida, you know, that's just a big giant sand dune. Have you guys been down to Sanford and those areas, Apopka, and seen the, seen the big dunes or the big hills? You know, I mean, that's, that's, well, for those of you from Colorado, that's not really elevation, right? But, but for those of us from down here, that's, that's pretty big, pretty big hills. And so it's, it's subtle sometimes on the landscape. But so the processes that build these are very common, and they're ongoing all the time. So here, I want to show you something really neat. This is a, a photograph I stole from, um, from online. It is a, a process here. This is a Florida beach, very small waves, maybe knee high. There's a little white water. There's a bunch of sand moving around, and there's this huge vortex going on out here that's moving sediments, right? So, so while it appears fairly calm and, you know, no big deal, just a small wave day. Big things are happening just off the beach. And these processes, if you can imagine that, that, that being a summer day little swell, what happens when waves are big, you know? So when we have big swells, big things happen. So these processes are ongoing not only in, in time series, but also in magnitude, okay? So the, the things that made those big dunes may have been big processes, big oceans, deep water. Um, I don't know. I love to surf, but I don't know who's getting the worst end of this deal. Um, but you can imagine that that's, those, that kind of energy can really move things along. And so if we want to see the evidence of that energy, let's look at the landforms. This is just north of us. This is a little Talbot. It's got a great... Um, there's nothing built there, so it's, it's easy to see. But what I, what I notice is this repeating pattern. Can you guys see that? So those, are, those, those green lines are actually the bottom of dunes, those are dune swales. Water accumulates there, plants grow, they're happy. Um, the tops are white sand, really dry, really well drained, not a lot growing there, right? Um, gopher tortoises love this place. Uh, as you notice, the north, north of the inlet here, in, uh, Matanzas, the park, looks very similar to this. It's not as defined, not as easy to see, but what I want you to note is not only there's a, there's a repeating pattern here, there's also an accretion of sediment and sand down at the end near this inlet. And so that process is moving sand not only onshore and building these, these dunes, but it's also moving, moving sand longshore and building down here. Now, if this inlet uh, is open and free, it continues to, to build on the north end and cut on the south end. What we see in Matanzas Inlet is that the south end is armored, so we can't move. So as the... As, as nature does its thing and moves sand down, it's going to continue to fill in here. And maybe a new inlet will form somewhere else. Okay, so now we saw that process at a scale of, of several hundred meters. We saw all those little, those little dunes. But let's look closer to home. So this is State Road 206. A lot of you probably came over this way to come down tonight. There's my favorite place, Matanz Inlet, the lab, US-1, and I-95. And what I want you to do is relax your eyes a little bit. This is the barrier island. Right? And then we have this low spot. So this line is the edge of the salt marsh to the upland transition. So we go from salt marsh to pine trees, right? So this is a, this is a, 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 a pretty definable distance. And if you look a little bit, you see it again. There it is again. Now, that's a, that's a power line uh, right of way. You think it's equidistant from US 1, which is pretty interesting. And then that's equidistant from I 95. Well, engineers aren't crazy. Right? They want to they put things in where it's dry, build the least number of bridges they can, um, and move the least amount of dirt. So these are basically dunes. This is a trough. This is the peak of the dune, which makes our, makes our beaches. There's another dune system, another dune system, and another dune system. And in between here are low spots. In here, you'll see all of our wetlands, you know, as you move across our, our low-lying areas. And so... That pattern repeats itself at multiple scales here. Out on the beach, we see lots of little dunes here, right? Lots of little dunes. Then we see the barrier island scale, remember? All right, and then at a scale maybe five or six times as wide as that, we see the intercoastal marshes and then relic landforms across the state. And if you're driving on 206, and you pay close attention, and some people will call me out on this, but I promise it's true. Um, <clears throat> if you're driving along, you'll notice uh, little, little marshes on the side of the road. 
you go through, and you'll see the, the, the cut grades in, the, in the, the pine flatwoods. You'll see a little sandy, sandy cap, and then you're in a low spot, and there's some, some wetland plants and some marshy area, and then it's back up. And so overlaying this, this broad, long dune system is a bunch of little undulations, and they're very, they're, they've been weathered for 20,000 years, right? So those dunes have kind of been beaten down. That tells us a couple of things, though. It gives us a visual cue that that's the kind of process that built that area. So all those, all those wetlands have some linearity to them. That's pretty neat. But um, it also tells us that as the ocean receded, you know, it re receded kind of episodically. Right? So there were episodes of, of recession of sea level to create these resulting patterns. And it's kind of consistent, which is also kind of interesting to me. It's like, wow, there were, there were episodes of, of sea level dropping. Now, we don't know what went on out here very well outside of the... Um, the uh, geologic record because it, sand just moves around and it's really hard to, to see things in sand. But um, I want you to, to think about that and I want to I drive it home a little bit. Let's look at Cape Canaveral, right? So if you look closely, you'll see here's, here's the intersection of several large dune systems, right? Intercoastal waterway, another intercoastal waterway, two low spots, sand coming down the state of Florida and building on this end and, and Cape Canaveral will continue to build out this way. That's the dominant land process, right? But more importantly, let's look at what we see. We see those little linear features on the landscape because, you know, this isn't all houses. This is the launch pad area. All those little, little linear wetlands. And if you come over, let's look down. This is the Melbourne area. This is where my, uh, my wife is from and her parents live. And this is West Melbourne. And it starts to get wet here. It starts to get swampy. And that's the headwaters of the St. John's River. And then we get high again. As you go across um, uh, on your way to Kissimmee. So you see that repeating pattern at yet a, a larger scale of maybe 15 miles. Okay? And it's going over and over again as we move across. And you'll also see embedded in that several of those linear features again, right? So those are those, those are dune swales from tens of thousands of years ago as the ocean has receded this way. So embedded in all of those landforms, we see the same, the same signal, that kind of sine wave signal in various stages across the landscape. And I want you to, to keep that in mind because there's one more that's really important that I want to I point out. If you look at the, the highlands and lowlands, this is as, as, as simple as I think we can make it. An elevation, elevation gradient of 100, of 100 feet at a time. So everything here is basically less than 100 feet, and everything in green is, is more than 100 feet. You see those? So those are the, the relic giant dunes of Florida. That's when sea level was 100 feet higher uh, than our highest point in the state. And lots of large-scale ocean processes were building those ridges. And you've heard the, the, the term central ridge, the Florida central ridge, so it's the highest one. It comes right down the middle of the state. Now, this gets lower, it gets, it gets shorter as you go south, but those patterns are still there. So those, those linear features are still embedded at even a broader 50-mile scale. Okay? So now when you're, when you're cruising across the state, I want you to think about that. Not only can you drive across the island or walk across the island and see all those, you can also see them in terms of visioning how our ecosystem is responding to change. All right, so if you were to look at this model, and this is my really bad art, um, I apologize. Let's think about this as, as, a, as a, uh, a barrier island, and you've got salt marshes and some seagrasses and some corals out here in deeper water. And as that erodes and as sea level rises, we see these ecosystems marching in. Right? So they're moving into, the, into what, is, what we're thinking of as Anastasia Island as our barrier island. At some point, the, the, the corals are moving forward, our seagrasses are moving in, our salt marshes... Maybe if we were, we were looking at mangroves, we could interchange those here. And then at some point, it's underwater, right? It's a shallow sea and maybe really deep. But that process indicates to us as, as sea level comes up again, these systems are going to move forward, right? And these systems are, are, are constantly on the move. We don't see them in the course of a year or two years moving, but we can see evidence of them. Um, I'll say that this is right off of State Road 206 looking north. And you'll notice this is the salt marsh, and this is the fringing uh, uh, juncus or needle rush, and then the upland. And if we look in, uh, in the soils here, over time, we can see the same soil layers in the upland 
expressed out here as they're being slowly drowned by rising sea level. Really interesting thing about the plants in the, in the coastal marshes is they're, they're very much relegated by their inundation tolerance, so their, their elevation makes all the difference. And if you want to see what the, what the soil surface looks like across the marsh, just look at the vegetation. You can tell these zones indicate depth of flooding. Okay? And so that's one of the really useful things about looking at the marsh and saying, oh, well, you know, as this, as this front, this gray plant is Juncus romarianus or black needle rush. It's kind of sharp, so watch out. But when you're out there, as that front moves toward the upland, that's increased inundation that it doesn't like. So it's going to seek out the elevation that works for it. And this is, this is kind of how marshes um, uh, uh, build themselves in terms of, of vegetation properties. Okay? So this is what makes up the ecosystem. And it's all based on that elevation. Now at some point as sea level comes up, well, you know, we're moving up into this maritime forest. And this is not something new. This has happened before. And all we have to do is look down on the ground to see the evidence of that. Now, our seagrass ecosystems, they like, they have a, a relationship with water too, and with elevation. There's a certain depth that they like based on water clarity and getting sunlight and all those things. And they, they certainly have a preference for soils. Um, and so those, those ecosystems will move as well. All right? They'll move based on um, their opportunity. And of course, mangroves. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more because this is something that we're seeing right now. But mangrove ecosystems are, are very much relegated to particular water depths. So elevation, those sand dunes, the, all those erosional processes build these ecosystems too. And so the last couple of things I want to tell you about before I, I close is that as climate changes, which is happening right now, those, those ecosystems are going to make their, their landward migration, and we're seeing it here. Not only are they making a migration landward, but they're also moving with response to temperature. So climate change is visible, if there were any doubters, right outside our door. And I, I challenge you to, to have a look at this sometime when, you, when you're outside. This is the lab, and this is the 312 bridge up in St. Augustine. Mangroves are, are subtropical species. The shrubby plants that are out in our marsh now, they're, they're trees, they're hard, woody, woody species, and they like it warm. They don't like to be frozen back. And so over the course of time, in the last several 20 to 30 years, these guys have been making a pretty strong march northward. All right, so we're starting to see them all down here. As you leave tonight, if you go north, both sides of the road are completely covered with black mangroves. And so these guys are, are making their way north because our, our winter freezes are, are less frequent and less harsh. It's not the first time, and some of you might want to point that out. Uh, this has happened before. If you look at old photographs of St. Augustine, 100 years ago there were mangroves here. So they're, they kind of come and go. But they respond to long-term changes in climate. And so we're seeing that, and this is one of the few places you know, in the United States where you can visually see climate change happening. So, salt marsh dominated by that cord grass, the mangrove areas, and you can see all these guys popping up in our salt marshes are that indicator of change. Now, we talk about sea level rise, too, with climate change. As temperature comes up, we're also getting, we're also getting sea level rise. You know, in the news, I mean, this, this tide gauge is our oldest tide gauge in the United States. It's in Key, uh, Key West, Florida. Um, and over, over that 150 years of, of information, we're seeing a gradual rise. You say, well, what's the big deal? You know, that's a couple of millimeters, you know, um, in, in over a century. But what we don't know is what triggers those large climatic events that we see evidence of in our geology, right? We see that in 20,000 years, we had a 500-foot change in sea level in Florida. So a meter over 100 years is not that that far out of range, right? It's happened before. In fact, it's been much, much faster before. So our estimates, science says, well, you know, there it could be anywhere from 15 centimeters, which is a, you know, um, uh, or 20 centimeters, maybe a foot to two foot, all the way up to six feet. Now, can you imagine six feet of seawater? That's the mean, mean water level here. You know, this room would be wet at six feet of sea level rise. But it's not uncommon. And so we've got to think about that in terms of how we manage our landscapes. And my last little bit here is going to be to say, you know, in St. Augustine, we've got, we've got uh, room to expand, which is great. A lot of people have worked really hard to make sure we have all these natural areas. And, and we've, 
we have unimpeded expansion areas for our salt marshes. So as sea level comes up, or soon to be mangroves, um, we have places for them to go. So these little subtle changes in elevation, even in a few centimeters, can make a big difference for, for an ecosystem, especially one dominated by, by a particular type of plant that has a very, very close range of, of, of habitat. So we have lots of, lots of, of, of area for expansion. But if we're not careful, and I'm going to go down to Indian River Lagoon, and this is actually uh, um, close to Cocoa, Florida, we see that there's not as much room to expand. You know, these are old... Um, uh, these are coastal wetlands. They were formerly uh, mosquito impoundments that have been opened back up. And you can see seagrass beds from up here. Um, but as water level comes up, that, that, that uh, little niche for those particular ecosystems may change. And the extreme version of this is Miami. So this is what happens when you're built all the way to the water. There's no expansion there, no chance. So those systems are literally lost with sea level rise. And so you know these guys get flooded every year with the king tides, right? So, I mean, it's already happening. And, and maybe for the United States, this is probably the most impacted area for sea level rise effects that we know of. So something to think about when, it, when um, we talk about managing our, our landscapes here is we want to keep those coastal ecosystems and give them space to expand as, as climate change occurs. So my take home and wrap up. We talked about a sense of place. We talked about... Um, our ecosystems in Florida, ones that you guys readily recognize and you will as, you, as you're out and about um, day to day, and that these terrestrial systems, the aquatic systems, and the coastal systems all have something in common, and that is that they are all dependent on elevation, simply elevation, and that elevation related to water level, whether it be salt water or fresh water, doesn't matter, but that's the dictator in Florida of, of where you are, and you know how flat Florida can be, so it doesn't take much change to, to go a long way. Okay, and then we talked about the geologic history. I hope, I hope some of that stuff um, was interesting and that you can see that if you're traveling around Florida and you see these limestone outcrops or you see, you see the geology at play when you go across the roller coaster road to Gainesville, um, you can put some of that back together and say, oh yeah, I remember what's holding on there. Um, it took 160 million years to build the, the foundation of Florida, right? That's a long time. But only 20,000 years to make it what it is today. So in, in, the, in the course of 20,000 years, all of the ecosystems and the landscape that we visualize today happened really quickly. I mean, that's, that's fast in geologic terms. So long-term building, short-term manipulation. And then finally, that these coastal ecosystems, the ones that are closest to us where we live now, are, uh, they're evolving. They're on the move, right? And they are responding to climate change. They're responding to sea level rise. They're very dynamic. And so the things that we see, like the inlet changing and the mangroves coming and the beach erosion, all those things are processes that occur all the time. And those are ones that we should anticipate and, and, and potentially plan for. All right, I'm going to leave you with that. I'm going to say thank you very much. Um, thank you to uh, some of my colleagues, too. Mark, Barbara, Kat, for all... Uh, seeing this talk several times as I prepared it. Um, questions? In order for everyone to uh, hear the question, we have these handy microphones. So if anybody has a question, um, just raise your hand and we'll pass the microphone over. You won't have to repeat yourself. Well, I think, okay, so um, yes, there were several actual ice ages or glaciation periods. And what happened was as, as ice sheets moved down across North America, they did a lot of stuff. Not only did they scrape mountains apart, but they moved material. And then as they receded, they melted, and that, that glacial wash actually moved a lot of material too. The last one, I think, and we look at, we, look at, um, the, we think about the soil map that I showed you, uh, the 20,000-year period before, that, that Pliocene material is the, is the majority of the sand material that we see at the surface today. So yes, it's very significant. All four of those periods were significant in, in forming Florida. Um, and what you didn't see in the, in the slides that I showed you of kind of the rise of Florida out of the, out of the ocean is there's actually a whole movie of that. And as, as Florida comes out of the ocean, the, the sea level goes down and up and, and covers Florida several times and exposes it several times. Now, the files were just so huge, I couldn't show them to you. But what I want to impart to you is that, that that process was extremely dynamic. So Florida could grow out 
several hundred miles on its sides, and then and also within a million years be covered with water again. So those processes were, were ongoing. Um, you mentioned that Matanzas, the inlet is filling. Can you elaborate about how fast that's happening and what's going to happen? So in my, in my short time here, I've been in Florida since 1997, um, and, and the first thing I did when I got to Gainesville as a graduate student is I charted out the way to go fishing and go surfing, right? You know, as any good graduate student would do, um, how can I relax the most? And so I remember coming to Matanzas Inlet way back then and seeing, you know, uh, what we have remembered for a long time to be an open inlet. And, and just recently, it seems like in like the last five years, I've seen some tremendous changes there. I mean, we know the washover that occurred and filled um, Summer Haven River. Um, these processes can be episodic. And what, what happens is they, as they're, they're ongoing, they're ongoing all the time, where sand is moving from north to south in Florida every single day. And, you know, if you live up in St. Augustine by the pier, you know they renourish on a regular basis. They bring, they pump sand up, and that sand gets eaten away and it moves down the beach. And at some point, it ends up down here in our inlet, right? So it's, it's slowly filling in. Now we have some big episodes that will move sand in and clear it out. Uh, but in the long run, that, the process for the inlet is to migrate south. And with armor on one side but not on the other, we end up with this kind of slowly closing process. And I think that, you know, while it, it pains me to even think about it, I think that inlet is closing. And it's a natural process. Um, unfortunately, you know, as we saw with the, the filling of Summerhaven River, it, it, you know, that was a, a pretty rapid process. I mean, that was a snap your fingers and it's, it's happened, you know, with one big storm. But, you know, the filling of the inlet is more of a slow process. And when I drove home today, uh, earlier today, I noticed that even more sand is in the inlet now. I mean, the, the backside of um, the park area is, is tremendously shallow. It's, 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 it's moved a lot of sand even in the last couple of months. So I think as it becomes more clear what's happening, you know, we'll all recognize that process as having happened really fast, but really it's kind of, a, it's kind of an incremental thing. I think, unfortunately, though, that the process is, is getting near its completion. Yeah. Well, to give you an idea of just how dramatic it can be, um, those of us who have been here long enough can remember when the pier at the lighthouse was actually a beach pier. Right, right. And uh, I can remember in my time when, you know, there was a bar that at low tide was a wash, and, and then it, over the years it emerged and became the north end of uh, Anastasia Park. And uh, I did have a question, though, and that is, in, in one of your early diagrams, you had a steep head ravine, which uh, struck me as being what I remember as Goldhead Branch. And I'm f oh, wondering okay. if you f are familiar with Goldhead Branch uh, State Park and the ravine there. Uh, what was the geological uh, process that created that uh, Formation. I'm not. I'm not familiar uh, with Goldhead very well. I mean, I know of it, but I don't know much about it. And I'll say this: the the processes, you know, of of limestone dissolution. These these, you know, basically all it takes is rainwater. So the acidity of rainwater is is low enough to dissolve limestone. And it's a really slow process. One of the things that I didn't get into in this talk that I wanted to show you guys um, was that one of the ways we look at geological processes is through stalagmites in caves in Florida and in the Bahamas. So some of the, some of the most interesting climate work has been done by taking those stalagmites and cutting them in half and looking at all the little bands because there's some predictability in time, kind of like a tree ring, and you can see large growth bands and small growth bands, and then the minerals in those growth bands kind of tell you what was going on. So in that, I think that's, is that the disappearing stream? Is that in Goldhead? Okay, yeah, so it's, it's bubbling up from the ground. Um, all of our systems, and I know springs in Florida are, are kind of like part of Florida's culture, right? You know, I mean, these, are, these are epicenters of activity, ones that I study on my own uh, even now. And, and all of those processes are related to groundwater and related to the kind of the Swiss cheese that we exist on, which is that, that limestone base. And so there are places in Florida where, where rivers uh, drop into the ocean or drop into the limestone and places where they come out as springs. Uh, I'd be interested to know whether you have a, a view to share on the controversy about the proposed significant extraction of fresh water from the St. John's River to feed new communities in the area. Well, 
turn off your phones. <laughs> No, um, you know, and, and one of the cool things about being in academia is I can pretty much just spout off and I won't get in too much trouble. But no, what I really think is important about that is that, um, you know, water is our resource, right? It's everybody's resource. How we use it is really important. And there is some growing limit based on our resources that we need to appreciate. Now, there was some several proposals years ago to, to go to go to North Florida and tap groundwater and pipe it to South Florida because South Florida's running out of water. Well, you know, the obvious thing to me is that, well, then, you know, we got to stop piping people to South Florida and think about, you know, hey, if you run out of water, we don't have enough water. Um, I don't agree with the idea of, of dispersing surface waters, uh, but I do think that that's a, that's a big issue and one that Florida's got to kind of come together on, you know. Uh, we've got to decide how we're going to use these resources. I mean, right now, what, what is it, a, a gallon of water in the store is a, is a dollar or two, but our price for municipal water is really cheap. You know, in other places in the world, that, that resource is, is, you know, is life-giving. It's, it's worth everything. So we have, a, we have a luxury here with our water supplies, but they are limited. They are a finite resource. And so without getting in too much trouble, I'll say I think um, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that there is some growth limit to how much, you know, how much Florida can stand in terms of us, you know, and I can't say anything about people wanting to come here because I came here too, and I love Florida, so did I dodge that appropriately? Okay. I wanted to ask you what really has been bothering me forever. I said, if that's the notion, how can you academically justify a notion called climate change when you just sat here for an hour and explained to us constantly that there is climate change all the time has always been. And this is just part, so it doesn't delineate anything at all. To say there is climate change, of course there is climate change. When wasn't there a climate change, there were will there be a climate change. So as, you know, whatever other things are behind it, politically or academically or whatever, the very term just simply bothers me enormously because it just is a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't mean anything whatsoever. If you say it's warming, fine. If you say it's cooling, fine. But just saying that it's changing when, I mean, of course it's changing. I, I don't disagree. It's absolutely changing, right? right? Now, I mean, it, it, politically, we're always trying to point a finger at it. why is that happening. You know, I'll, I'll say this, as, as, a, as a scientist, I believe that we're not helping the process any, you know. So, so global warming is a process that, that is, has happened in the past, and our geologic record shows that it's happened, you know, that our oxygen levels have been tremendously higher, our CO2 levels have been ten times what they are in the atmosphere right now, in, you know, before man ever walked the face of the earth, right? So, are we driving that? That's a debatable thing. So these processes are, are, are driven by chemistry, right? Um, and this is an ongoing planet, it, things move. I don't disagree with you that it has gone on forever. What I will stand up here and say to you is that I believe that we aren't necessarily stemming that process any by our activity. So if we take all that carbon that's stored in the ground and we shunt it back up to the atmosphere, we're speeding it up. And one of the things that we need to be we need to recognize is that those, those activities do have a, a, a repercussion over time. You know, we, may, we may feel that, those of us in this room, in our lifetimes. You know, we might see some, some dramatic impact from that. Over geological time, how important are the long-term cumulative effects of hurricanes with the formation of coastal ecosystems? And I, I hope you're not a goofy foot also. Oh. I, I, I think they're tremendous. I think, you know, so we, we looked at how sediment moves and how things are processed, even on a calm day, right? So, so sand's moving all the time. We increase that process or the energy in that process. Absolutely, I think they're tremendous. I think we, we can see in the geologic record there, uh, in the recent geologic record, there have been cataclysmic storms in the state of Florida that have moved tremendous amounts of material. Um, an example would be the southern Everglades. So, so marl is a material that's, that's kind of made out of calcium carbonate. It's, it's, it's mud. It's white mud. It's kind of neat. It's a marine deposit. And several hurricanes in the past, uh, since I've been working in the Everglades, have moved half a meter of this material from Florida Bay up into the southern Everglades. And so that has changed by weight 
the surface elevation and change the marsh vegetation in those areas. So I think it's, I think it's really important. Now, as we see uh, uh, maybe a, an increased um, occurrence of tropical storms, we didn't this year, right? I mean, all the surfers in the room were like, woo, we didn't have any waves. But this, uh, this process over long term, I think is tremendous. Yes. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, I hope you'll look at the state of Florida a little bit differently uh, tomorrow morning uh, when you're driving uh, to work or, uh, or to home. So let's thank Todd one more time, and thank you for thank coming Thank you. Out.